Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, if you're visiting with us, thank you so much for being with us this morning. You're an honored guest, and um, we truly are thankful that you've chosen to become uh, or to come and be with us this morning. And um, just know that uh, you're always welcome here at Hartville. And so, if you have more opportunities to come and be with us and to worship with us, uh, please. Uh, make it a priority to do so. We love having visitors and we love getting to know our visitors. And so just know that you're welcome here anytime. Okay, so is your conscience a safe guide? Uh, that's a valid question. You may recall in the movie Pinocchio in 1940, if I'm not mistaken, that was the second animated movie by Walt Disney. Uh, I think uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was, was the first one and then it was followed by Pinocchio. Now, you may recall uh, the plot in Pinocchio. Um, of course, Geppetto was a uh, woodworker. Uh, he created, uh, I guess it's called a, um, a Marionite. I was not familiar with that term. You know, it's a puppet with, it's, with, that you can move and with strings. Uh, and his, he named him Pinocchio. And uh, before he went to bed that night, uh, he made a wish on a star uh, that Pinocchio would become a real boy. Well, later that night, uh, a blue fairy uh, appears and she turns Pinocchio and uh, she brings him to life. Of course, he's still a puppet, but she does tell him that if he can prove uh, to be brave, if he can prove to be uh, uh, truthful and also un unselfish, that he can become a real live boy. And toward the end there, she tells uh, Pinocchio, and remember Pinocchio, be a good boy and always let your conscience be your guide. Well, is that good theology? And I read somewhere someone called that cricket theology. Um, we're going to look into that. Uh, you know, pop or popular uh, modern culture would say, uh, always let your conscience be your guide or just always follow what your conscience says. Um, well, you know, God says that there is a way that seems right to a man, but that way, or the end of that way, is death. We see that in Proverbs uh, chapter 16 and verse 25. Okay, so is your conscience a safe guide? What is your conscience? I knew I was going to have trouble saying that word, get up here and stumble around. What is your conscience? How does it work? Um, your conscience. I want us to look at uh, Romans chapter 2. I want us to look at verse 14 and 15. As you're turning there, I want to give you a little bit of background, a little bit of context to Romans, uh, at least the first three chapters. Um, really, Paul, what he's setting out to do in the first three chapters of Romans is to essentially establish that, that there are none righteous. There are none. No, not one. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. For we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3 and verse 23. Uh, he focuses on uh, the, the fact that the Jews and the Gentiles both are, um, well, they have no excuse. They're, they're lawbreakers. Uh, whatever law that they live under, they all have violated law and therefore they are uh, lost. You know, they can't be justified by law. Okay. Um, and so in Romans chapter 2, he's actually emphasizing just the, the Gentile situation here. I want you to look at verse 14 and 15 with me. We learn some, some very important truths here, I believe, about um, us being created in the image of God. Uh, in verse 14, for when Gentiles who do not have the law, okay, that is, they do not have a special revelation, the special revealed law, uh, for example, like the law of Moses. The Jews had the, the law of Moses that prophets that they, they spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They were guided by the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, Gentiles, the Gentiles did not have special revelation. They did not have that special law. But by nature do the things in the law. These, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. Now look at verse 15. We're going to read verse 15, but then I want us to focus on the first part of 15 and then the second part. Verse 15, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. Now in the verse, first part of verse 15, who show the work of the law written in their hearts. I believe what this is here is actually a reference to 
something that we all have. And it, it all started from the beginning. Um, that is sort of this innate moral consciousness. This, this innate moral awareness, okay, we could state it that way, um, of, of just certain basic moral laws. That is to say that God created us in His image, and because God created us in His image, um, that, that we're created with this sort of built-in awareness of even just basic moral law. And so that means that, that, that people everywhere are created in the image of God, um, even if they don't have you know, special revelation as, as the Scriptures here, um, you know, they know, they have a, a basic general knowledge that, uh, for example, that they're to honor their father and mother, uh, that, that they're not to murder or to commit adultery, that they're not to bear false witness or to covet their neighbor's wife. You know, these moral laws that, have, that are universal and the, that are eternal, they have always existed and always will exist. The Gentiles had that, just like all of us have it. Well, obviously, because of sin, it becomes corrupted. Um, you know, I mean, you think about uh, raising a child, uh, for example, um, some of the uh, world religions, I think of Islam, where, you know, some of the radical uh, Muslims will, um, you know, seek to, to kill infidels. And to them, obviously, that's fine and right. I mean, they're... Uh, following their conscience in that, okay? Well, obviously you see that it was distorted. Uh, you know, from the beginning it was not so. And so my point is, is even that, that innate uh, moral awareness or consciousness or knowledge of basic moral law becomes corrupted because of sin. And I believe that's what he is referencing there at the beginning part of verse 15, who show the work of the law written on their hearts. It's a moral law code, a moral heart law code. Now at the later part of verse 15, their conscience also bearing witness. You know, we said we have an, an innate uh, moral awareness, a built-in moral awareness or knowledge of, of right and wrong, at least the basic moral laws. Well, here is an innate or a built-in, um, you know, conscious. <laughs> conscience. Okay, so what it essentially does is, okay, it does, not, um, it does not provide what's right and wrong. It does not originate truth. But what it does is it's an ability, it's a function, a built-in ability and function that examines and passes judgment on our conduct. It assesses our thoughts, the intents, our motives, um, our feelings, and it passes judgment. And then what it does is it usually then magnifies um, those things that are against or in violation to the standard or the law that guides it. You know, there's a standard or law that guides you know, our conscience. Every one of us have a, um, some type of belief system, value system, some type of grid, belief grid by which we view the world and by which we view our own lives and conduct. And our conscience then, it either approves those things that are consistent with the standard or law that guides it, or it condemns the conduct that is in violation to the standard or law that guides it. And so what it does then is it magnifies the wrong, the sense of wrongness of the things we do, and also magnifies the sense of shame and guilt that we have when we violate the standard or law that guides our conscience. And so I hope that made sense. I hope that uh, you understand that, that um, when we think about the innate moral conscience that we have, it's not a source of knowledge, but it reacts to the standard of the law that guides our conscience. And so there's a big difference there. Okay, now in order for it to properly function, uh, depends on uh, the accuracy of the law or standard that guides it, in other words. Um, for example, when we think about um, the law or standard that guides our conscience, it can become distorted. It can be misguided. 
Uh, when you think about, uh, for example, in Judges chapter 17 and verse 6, it says in that particular context there that uh, in that day uh, there was no king in Israel and every man did what was right in his own eyes. You see, in other words, what was right in this person's eyes might not be right in that person's eyes. And, and what you have is you basically have a nation of people who were just, just acting according to what they thought was right. There was no true objective standard to guide their conscience. And so they just were left sort of doing what they thought was right. And well, we, when we read that in Judges chapter 17 and verse 6, it's not a positive statement, okay? I believe we live in a nation where people do what is right in their own eyes. I mean, when you think about it, is that not true? We even hear people say that truth is subjective. Whatever's true to, for you uh, may not be true for me, and there's no objective standard to guide our conscience. You know why? Because it's gotten distorted in the minds of people, in the minds of the people of our culture. We once sort of used to, at least the majority, followed for the most part the same, the same standard, the same objective. It was guiding people's conscience, not... It's not the case anymore. Uh, when you think about it, uh, John chapter 17 and verse 6, Jesus warned His, uh, His apostles that there would come a time when their enemies would persecute them thinking that they were rendering God a service. You see how it got distorted for them? It's like the Apostle Paul, uh, he declares in Acts chapter 23 and verse 1 and Acts chapter 24 and verse 16, um, just how he persecuted the church. And that while he was persecuting the church, that he did it with all good conscience, with a clear conscience. Well, was he right? No, he wasn't right. Well, you know why? Because the standard, the law that guided his conscience was distorted. You know, there was a certain misconceptions, uh, certain uh, uh, preconceived notions on what the Messiah would do and what He would look like, and, and Jesus didn't fit that preconceived idea. And it caused many of them to you know, reject Jesus, uh, to persecute Him, and, and uh, all kinds of different things. But uh, the point is, is, is our conscience is not a safe guide. For one, it's because, well, it depends on the accuracy of the law or standard that guides it. And that, that standard or law that guides our conscience, it can be distorted. It can be misguided. And if it's misguided or distorted, then certainly our conscience is not going to be accurate. It's not going to be uh, truthful. You think about 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1-13, through 13, that particular text, uh, there were some who... Uh, well, they couldn't eat meats offered to idols. What would Paul say? You know, a meat offered to an idol is nothing. Okay, we know that. But, you know, there are some, though, because they're the standard, like I was saying, the, the, the law that guided their conscience w was distorted. They really were convicted in their hearts and their minds, genuinely so, that they were committing sin. And you see, so it can work both ways. You know, our... Uh, the law that, that, that guides our conscience can be distorted and, and we can, uh, well, we can call evil good and we can call good evil. You see, Isaiah 5 and verse 20, that's exactly what was happening in the days of Isaiah. There were those who were calling evil good and good evil. And that can happen, certainly, when we allow our conscience to be our guide and the standard or law that guides our conscience becomes distorted. We can call evil good and good evil. But also our conscience, though, not only can our standard be uh, distorted, uh, but uh, our conscience can be desensitized. It can be insensitive. Uh, I want you to turn with me to the Scripture that Brother Don read for us in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, I want us to read verses 1 through 4. I want us to note a word here in... Uh, I don't know if we got any people who like to write in the margins of their Bibles. Here's something that you might want to write in the margin of your Bible. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, or in latter times, some will depart from the faith, 
giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, the word seared there is is actually uh, the word from which we get cauterization. It literally means like branded. Now, you may know that whenever an animal is branded, uh, it actually loses uh, feel and sensitivity in that area because the nerves become, the nerve endings become so damaged. Now, think about someone's conscience becoming seared. It's like it's branded. It gets to the point where it, it can't feel the things that it ought to feel. I think of Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 15 in that particular section there. Jeremiah is, is talking about the people and the people... Uh, well, God actually, you know, in, in the book of Jeremiah is saying, oh, did they, were they ashamed when they committed an abomination? They were not ashamed at all, nor were they able to blush. You see, our conscience become, can become so seared that we are, we're not even ashamed. You know, we're, we can't even you know, blush over the sin in our lives. And see, that's a, a very sad state uh, to be in. I want you to also look with me in Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Because I think we need to be aware of the danger of having our conscience be desensitized. In Hebrews chapter 6, our conscience can become so seared and so without feeling that I believe that we can get into a condition to where it is impossible to be renewed to repentance. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 6. In verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good Word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. I mean, could you imagine that your heart becomes so seared and so calloused, so without feeling that... that that you can't even be renewed to repentance. I mean, that's a scary thought. Now you think about it, we've probably on a much smaller scale have probably experienced this to some degree or another, but I don't know if you've ever had any experience, uh, maybe you were in a spiritual low point in your life and you know, you'd sort of forsaken the assembly and man, I tell you, you're really convicted. You know, I mean, you know the standard that's guiding your conscience says, listen, you know, today's the day that the Lord has made. And it's an honor and a blessing to worship the Creator and Sustainer of the universe. And we forsake the assembly and we're convicted in our hearts. But then we miss two weeks and then three weeks. And that conviction becomes less and less. We become desensitized uh, to that. And of course, it can happen with any sin, any sin you know, that uh, we may find ourselves entangled in uh, to where initially, you know, the, the conviction, uh, the, the guilt and the shame is, is very intense. But the more that we engage in that, the more it becomes a practice, the more desensitized we become over time to that particular sin. We begin to minimize it. We begin to rationalize it in our own minds as to why it's, you know, really less of a big deal uh, than it really is. You know, that's a scary place to be. And so God wants us to, you know, uh, continue to uh, try to um, recalibrate, as we'll see here in a little bit. But before we do, I want us to look at one last thing here as we think about, uh, you know, the reason that our, our conscience is not a safe guide. And, and that is we can suppress our conscience. Um, we can um, ignore it. I think about sinning willfully. Sinning willfully is really the idea of, uh, that you know what you should do and you willfully choose to do otherwise. We can become desensitized to our conscience, but we can also just ignore it, just suppress it and just shove it away and get it sort of out of our minds and out of our hearts. Um, I want you to look with me in uh, Hebrews chapter 10. 
Hebrews chapter 10. Let me give you the context here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 and following. I believe that, that his primary, the primary application that, that we are to draw from this section is the fact that, uh, look at verse 26 and then I'll, I'll explain it more. In Hebrews chapter 10, and verse 26, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins. I believe his point, his primary point is, is that here you have some Jewish Christians, some Christians who had come out of Judaism, and they were seriously contemplating going back to Judaism. And I think the primary application here is when you sin willfully, you're the one who is willfully going back to the law of Moses. Okay, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. But I think a lot of the descriptive terms that he uses down through the, the following verses really applies to, to anybody uh, who's going to choose to sin willfully. And sin willfully is a person who chooses to, to practice a, a certain sin regardless of whether or not they know uh, or regardless of the fact that they know it's against the will of God. Okay, and so let us read this passage together. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Look at verse 28. He's making a contrast here. Anyone who re has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Okay, here you have some severe action and punishment taking place of the person who has rejected the law of Moses. But of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the, the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he has sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? You see, it's a terrible thing to reject Moses' law. But of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has what? Trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which He was sanctified, just you know, a common thing, an ordinary thing, without any redeeming power, and insulted the Spirit of grace. For we know Him who said, Vengeance is mine, I'll repay, says the Lord. And again, the, the Lord will judge His people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so when you think about this, um, sinning willfully, now, I don't, I don't uh, you know, there's the, this idea that, that all sin is equal in the eyes of God. I don't, I don't see that in Scripture. I, I, I think that, um, well, in, Scripture would indicate that, that God weighs certain sins heavier than others. And so sinning willfully certainly would be a weightier sin than someone sinning in ignorance. And I think about Demas. Demas in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. Uh, I remember Demas had forsaken me, having loved this present world. Listen, Demas was, was a, a companion of Paul. He knew better, but he loved the present world so much that he willfully chose to forsake Paul and ultimately the, the Lord And because he loved this present world. Do you remember King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 11 through 24? Whenever his kingship is stripped from him, it's stripped from him. Why? Because he turned his back on the Lord. Because he would no longer keep the commandments of the Lord. He knew better. I mean, he was, he was a spiritual leader of, of the nation of Israel. You know, Saul started off, his, you know, his reign wasn't, it didn't start off terrible. He actually did some, some good things, but it just kept getting worse and getting worse. And he became more selfish and more rebellious. But then we think about David. David was a man after God's own heart, wasn't he? There's a lot of characteristics that I believe that, that help define David as a man after God's own heart. But I believe that one of them is the fact that, man, I tell you, he, he had a pure conscience. Yeah, he had his moments where he slipped and, and, and fell uh, like we all do. But, I mean, his conscience was guided by the will of God. And that's what we need to be. We need to be people who our conscience is guided by the objective truth of God's Word. And so here's what I want to suggest with the, just a few moments that, that, that I want to spend up here is the fact that, that we... Um, listen, none of our conscience is infallible. Okay? We all need our conscience to be instructed. We need it to be... Um, 
aligned with the Word of God. We need it to be calibrated. Let's use that word. Um, you know, I worked in telecommunications uh, for about seven years, and, and we used to use this one tester. Uh, it was a fluke tester. There was other kinds of testers, but this is the one that we used at our company. Um, when you would open up the box, okay, there was a, a, a calibration cord. Now, some of these terms are drifting away from my mind because I don't do it anymore, okay? But you took this one piece of equipment and you hooked it up to the, to the, the head end here and you calibrated it. And what it did was it set the perfect standard. And then what you did then is you took that calibrated piece and you just put it back. You didn't use it for anything else other than just to calibrate and set the perfect standard. And then what you did then is you would test from one end to the other the cable that you pulled and terminated. And it tested for various things, you know, and it, it, it tested it and it compared it to the perfect standard. I mean, it would test it to see if your terminations were making, you know, good connection and whether or not, uh, you know, there was any kind of crosstalk or loss on its return. And so the idea, though, is this. This is how we become calibrated. This is how we align our conscience with the will of God. Remember I said that our conscience is only good in as much as our knowledge or our standard is accurate. And it becomes you know, misguided, it becomes distorted, and so we need to keep aligning you know, our, our standard, our values, our morals, our ethics with the Word of God so that we can have a conscience that is actually then, I mean, it's, you know, for the most part, it's, it's, uh, it's worth following. We can follow our guide in as much as it's trained or um, you know, guided by the, the objective Word of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for today. We're thankful, Father, that we could worship You in spirit and truth. We love You, Father, and in all that You do for us. Uh, we're certainly unworthy of your, your amazing grace and to be able to come into Your presence, but we sure do rejoice in the fact that, that, that You've extended Your grace to us and that we, and that we can come into Your presence. Uh, we realize, Father, that that our conscience is, is a wonderful thing, that you have, uh, it's a gift from you, a gift that, that helps us uh, uh, to be able to uh, just assess and pass judgment on our conduct. And so we realize the, how profitable it is for us in, in the spiritual realm and, and, and in religious matters. And so, Father, it's our prayer that, that we would uh, not neglect it, that, that we would uh, seek to train it and, and, and guide it by the objective truths of your word. Help us, Father, to be people of the book, to get into the word and to understand your will for us in our lives just more and more and, and more intimately uh, so that we can allow it to, to guide our conscience uh, accurately. And so, Father, it's our prayer that as we leave this place that, that we would... Uh, make it a priority to get into the Word and, and to uh, study it and to cherish it and try to internalize it so that we can be transformed uh, into the image of Your Son. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when we think about it, uh, cricket theology is not very good, okay? <laughs> um, it's, you know, it, was, it was neat for the movie. You know, Jiminy Cricket was, was served as Pinocchio's conscience. Okay, uh, our conscience is a gift from God, but it needs to be uh, trained and, and guided by the Word of God. And so we think about uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, for all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. I tell you, this book is, it, it truly is priceless. And so as we leave here uh, this, this morning, I want us to just have a, a renewed zeal to study the Word of God and that, that we can uh, pray and ask God to help us to understand it and also to, to apply it in our lives and to, to help it shape and, and form and, and mold our conscience. Uh, so that honestly, I mean, let's be truthful about it, that whenever we get in a position where we're, we're contemplating something that's in violation with God's Word, that our conscience, you know, will prick us in our hearts and really lay us open, okay? That's what it's there for when it's trained properly. 
And so um, that being said, that's the, uh, the application, the encouragement for us as we leave here. Uh, we want to extend the invitation. Uh, maybe there are some here uh, who need the prayers of the congregation. Uh, maybe they have uh, you know, been living outside of the will of God. Uh, you need the prayers and encouragement of your brethren. We want to pray with you and for you. We love you. We want to be a source of strength for you. Uh, now is a, a wonderful time for us to do that as we're all together in one place. Uh, that we can do that for you. Uh, maybe uh, you've already obeyed, maybe you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've never become a Christian. Um, you've been thinking about it. Uh, well, let me just say something. That's the most important decision you can ever make in your life. Um, you can leave here uh, redeemed, having your sins forgiven, have the hope of eternal life. You know, for the non Christian, the person who dies outside of Christ, they, they have no hope. There's no hope of. of you know, life after this life, because the Bible teaches us those who are uh, outside of Christ are condemned eternally. But listen, the choice is yours. You can change your status between God and the world by becoming a Christian. And so if you need to do that, uh, maybe you feel compelled to do that, and I hope and pray that you do. If you need to respond to the spiritual invitation of Jesus Christ, why don't you come forward as we stand and sing?